Hey, what's up everybody? I'm Eric Harrison. Welcome to the Death Twitch. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite horror movies. It's Phantasm from 1979, directed by Don Coscarelli. So Phantasm is a movie about death, trauma, and mourning that blends fantasy and reality into a twisted nightmare that there is no way of waking up from. This is a movie that offers more questions than answers. The first scene in the movie is Tommy is having sex with the Lady in Lavender in a cemetery. It turns out the Lady in Lavender is the tall man, he is a shapeshifter, and instead of shapeshifting like, kind of like a Dracula situation into a younger, more attractive male and picking up females to go fuck in the cemetery, he decides to be a woman and go fuck dudes. But that's his choice, not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> So the next scene introduces us to Jody and Reggie, uh, who are showing up for Tommy's funeral. Jody decides to go visit his deceased parents inside of Morningside, while Mike, who was told to stay far away from the funeral, of course does not obey and he's there watching everything happen. While visiting his parents in the mortuary, we get the really the official intro to the tall man, and of course the famous quote. The funeral is about to begin. Sir. Okay. Sir. So while Mike is spying on the funeral, after the, all the guys take the casket to uh, the burial spot and then leave, the tall man picks up that casket all by himself. And Mike witnesses this and he knows something is not right about that. Now, in the next scene, we've got Mike going to visit the fortune teller. Now, this is an interesting situation because I have to jump ahead to the end real quick just to say this is a movie with two endings. Uh, Phantasm insisted on uh, an ending where everything was just a dream or it was all real, and it gives us both, and we have to sort of make up our minds. With that in mind, when we come to the scene with the fortune teller, you have to wonder, is she even real at all? Or is Mike just not having a little phantasm, another fantasy? Is she real at all, giving him this advice? Or is she just a figment of his imagination? So what we get out of this scene is that Mike is afraid of losing his brother Jody. And understandably, considering that only two years earlier, they both lost their parents. And as far as I can tell, he has like an aunt and maybe some cousins, but he doesn't seem to have any brothers or sisters. Uh, aside from Jody, so it seems like this is like kind of his last close family member. It's understandable that he would be afraid of losing him, and he follows him everywhere. And again, this just harkens back to the themes of the movie, the fear of loss, and how we deal with that kind of loss. Another thing I like about this scene is the fear box, where they tell him to put his hand in, and then it kind of clutches him. It's like a Chinese puzzle, and she says, you have to relax and be... You have to be not afraid in order for the fear to release you and you can get your hand out. And she tells him, it's all in your mind. So there, we've got a nice little clue about what is actually taking place here. It really is all in his mind. At least from the, from the perspective of one of the endings. Next, we get introduced to another main character of this franchise, and that's the 71 Plymouth Himikuda. Now... I am a big muscle car fan, so anytime I get to admire one of these beauties in a movie, I'm a happy camper. And uh, Don Coscarelli went so far as to make sure that there was a muscle car in every single Phantasm movie. So it's any wonder why I like this series so much. Alright, coming up next we've got the infamous sitting here at midnight scene where uh, Reggie Bannister and Bill Thornsbury, both musicians, decide to uh, show off a little bit in our movie and give us a little tune. It's also just another excuse for the movie to give us clues about what's going on, what with the tuning fork and whatnot, which will come into play later. So this is some foreshadowing here with Reggie and his tuning fork. After that, for some reason, and I, for some reason I couldn't tell you, the fortune teller's daughter goes to the mortuary to check out what Mike told him, and of course she just gets fucking snatched. Why do you? Why would you do that? Oh, I'm gonna go there all by myself. I got no big deal. It's just a tall man taking people to another dimension. This damn girl. Anyway, <laughs> I love that Jody pulls up to his uh, his regular drinking spot, the Dunes Cantina. He just parks like. 
directly right there in front of the front door, even though there's literally a sign that says parking in back. But I guess he's like such a regular. Jody is such a drinker that he just gets special treatment, special parking at the Dunes Cantina. I got to go uh, visit this place sometime. Anyway, he sees the lady in lavender and takes her out to the cemetery to have him some sex. But uh, Mike's watching because he follows him everywhere. He gets attacked by a Jawa. I don't know if, I, if I'm allowed to use that word. I'm going to call them Jawas throughout this whole thing because what the fuck else do I call them? They're Jawas. Anyway, Mike is attacked by one of those little creatures, starts running away. Jody's like, oh shit, I better go see what's wrong with my little brother. He doesn't believe him. So this is one of the things that at first, for uh, the first half of the movie, Jody just does not believe what Mike has to say. He thinks he has an overactive imagination. Speaking of overactive imaginations, the next scene we get is a very famous scene, the nightmare in the cemetery. So uh, we get a dolly in of Mike laying in his bed and then suddenly it pulls back and he's in a cemetery. The tall man's there. Things are busting out of the ground to get him. One of those classic jump scares. So what do you know, Jody's back day drinking at the canteen and he pulls up to his special little parking spot and he goes in to have himself a couple. And you know what? Tie one off for me, buddy. Mike can't go into the bar, so he's like goes to wander around town. He sees the tall man who seems to be out running errands. I don't know. It's interesting to see the tall man in a location that's not the cemetery or mortuary. He's just kind of out in town. It's a little weird. But it's kind of cool because it kind of makes you think, oh yeah, he's he could actually literally be running errands. I don't know. We get a scene here where it's it's kind of difficult to gauge what the fuck is going on. Reggie's there with his ice cream truck. He's delivering some kind of ice creams. And then the tall man walks by, gets a feel of the cold, and he either likes or dislikes the cold. This is something that's pointed out by Don Coscarelli himself in the commentary is... When you watch this scene, can you tell whether the, the tall man hates the cold or if he loves it? And it's hard to tell. Um, ultimately, there is a deleted scene that explains this to us. The tall man hates the cold, and in the deleted scene, he gets sprayed by one of those fire extinguishers. Um, so, you know, apparently he doesn't like it. But when you remove that, it, the scene becomes much more ambiguous. Next, we got Mike working on the Cuda, and he apparently gets attacked again by these Jawas. I don't know why these motherfuckers keep attacking Mike. I guess because he saw the tall man lifting the casket. So now they just have to harass him. <laughs> anyway, again, Jody doesn't believe. He says maybe it's the retard Timmy up the street that cracks me the fuck up. Timmy! Because Jody won't believe him, Mike needs proof. He decides to go and investigate Morningside himself. I was one of talk about the pacing and, and, and the tone of this movie. A lot of people say it's very dreamlike and non-linear, which I, having just watched the movie four times in a row, I don't think I agree completely. Now, what this movie does have is a very slow, meticulous pace. Uh, a lot of the time, not all the time, when, it, when the editing needs to pick up, when the pace needs to pick up, it does. But there's scenes like this with Mike walking around the mortuary that are such slow burn scenes and it and i think that this is what people mean about dreamlike what what they say is dreamlike to me is just it's just very meticulous slow burn pace it kind of puts you in the moment with mike as he's walking around because it literally feels like it's real time you're it's like you're watching real time situations and this goes on for a long time. A lot of people get bored with this, and I think this is why a lot of people prefer the second one uh, over the first Phantasm movie, is because it's a lot snappier, there's a lot more going on. Me, personally, I prefer the slow burn. I like the real-time feel of it, because I feel like I'm there in the situation with Mike walking around this mortuary that's quite creepy. Anyway, the groundskeeper jumps out of nowhere, uh, grabs him, and I don't know what he was going to do with him. He was grabbing him. Like, ah, he could have just been like, hey, you don't belong here, but instead he was going to wrestle him or some shit. Now, here we finally, like 40 minutes into this movie, we get our intro to the spheres. Oh, yeah. And these things, what the hell are they? Well, it's never quite fully explained. I mean, they do some half-ass explaining in some of the sequels. But in this original movie, there's 
as I said earlier, Phantasm is a movie that offers more questions than answers, and that's what it's supposed to do. That's what pulls you in, because you're trying to figure out this en enigma. It's not explained to you why there's just some flying sphere with, like, blades on it that kills people. I gather myself that it's like a security guard, basically, was the sphere is. It's protecting the the gates, the, the portal that's in one of the rooms. That's my guess. But anyway, and now here we get a really good scene. Is This is a, a very good metaphor for what's going on in one of the storylines of Phantasm. Because we get the tall man mirror scene where the tall man shows up having, having after heard the commotion. And he mirrors... Mike's movements because ultimately ultimately the tall man is just a phantasm in Mike's mind he represents Mike's fear of death and because it's him it's its own it's his own fear it is him himself the tall man mirrors him and I love this scene but ultimately he chases Mike uh, out the mortuary uh, gets his fingers caught Mike cuts his fingers off but yellow blood comes flowing out. What this tells us is that the tall man and all these creatures have yellow blood because they're dead and they've been embalmed with formaldehyde. So they don't have red blood or blue blood in their systems anymore. They have yellow formaldehyde. So when he cuts his fingers off, that's what we see comes out. So that's an interesting thought and that just adds more dimension and more mystery. Like how is the tall man even alive if he's actually dead? So this brings us to one of my favorite <laughs> scenes in the movie because this whole time Jody has been a skeptic. He doesn't believe Mike. You know, he thinks Mike uh, is just kind of losing his mind because of all the funerals and all the loss. And But he's got this finger in a box that he cut off the tall man. He shows Jody and Jody goes from being a non-believer to, okay, I believe you. Just like that. Just like, mm, and I love that shit. It's so funny. Very, okay. very funny comic timing, but it's also kind of could be accurate if you saw that maybe you, you would turn to a believer in, in an instant who knows it's very funny though and then the damn finger turns into a fly which kind of makes sense because we've got the idea of death again and when you're dead you're rotting and when you're rotting flies and maggots show up so the fact that the tall man's finger wound up becoming like a monstrous fly that attacks them actually makes a lot of sense for the themes of the movie and while they're battling the fly, they try and throw it into the garbage disposal, which is a strange plan, but whatever. I just would have got the fly swatter myself. <laughs> I would have got that heavy-duty fly swatter. Maybe a 2x4. But anyway, Reggie shows up, and he's like, what the fuck is going on, guys? So Jody arms to the teeth, and he goes to Morningside to check out what's going on. Um, when he's in there, he wants to... I don't know. I guess he just... I don't know why he went there. I don't really know. I think he was going to check on his parents, right? But anyway, he gets attacked by a Jawa, and let me tell you what, what a lucky shot, because he had the gun on him, he's got a Jawa on his back, and he just aims like from two feet away. <laughs> what a lucky shot, he could have shot himself in the fucking head, man. That would have been it. Anyway, <laughs> lucky shot, moving up. <sighs> so Jody takes off, and then a hearse comes just hauling ass out of the gates, almost hitting him. And the next thing you know, Mike shows up. So then, awesome, great, we get ourselves a car chase and a gun battle at the same time. And a fucking badass muscle car at that, and a hearse. So we've got ourselves this awesome car chase. Jody's shooting at him. And it's, it's pretty cool that we've got a movie that can be horror, it can be comedy, and it, now it's action. Anyway, ultimately the hearse crashes, and what they find out is it had a Jawa inside. And the Jawa was Tommy. Their friend Tommy, who died at the beginning of the movie, he's been crushed down, and now he's one of the one of the tall man's slaves. I don't know why, but they decide to keep Tommy's body. I guess just because it's Tommy, it was their friend. So uh, Jody calls Reggie, and he says, "Bring your ice cream truck." And then the guys go back to the house to try and come up with a plan of how to deal with the tall man. Now this is f interesting because it's like. They don't have anybody to turn to. You can't just go to the cops with something like this. There's no one else to turn to, but they know they have to do something. They can't just let the tall man take over their town and then, like, an infection keeps spreading and ultimately take over the world. They have to do something. And I really like Reggie's attitude in this scene because he's he's so gung-ho about, let's just 
kidnap him and stomp his ass in. <laughs> Reggie, like, yeah, dude, that's the fucking spirit right there. But Mike tells him, dude, nah, he's really, he's really, he's really pretty tough. He's strong. You can't just beat him up. Jody, um, as is the case throughout the whole movie, constantly trying to get rid of Mike and Mike constantly trying to follow Jody. Jody's like, no, you're gonna go and stay with your aunt at the antique shop. So then we get this shot of Mike walking around the antique shop. He finds a picture of the tall man and the tall man looks at him and he knows what that means. Shit is not over. Reggie crashes. Mike says, I got to go. I got to go. We got to get out of here. I know that there's something wrong. So that they're on their way back and then they come across the accident. And next thing you know, everybody's getting attacked by Jawas in the car. It's kind of a silly scene. It goes on for a little longer than it needs to. It's also quite silly how Mike gets pushed out the back window and the car just drives away. <laughs> I'm assuming the Jawas were driving. I'm not sure. So Mike arrives back at the house and Jody was worried about him because he knew somehow, I think some kind of psychic situation, he knew something wasn't right. Um, again, again, just to keep nailing the themes home, Jody locks Mike in his room and leaves him. And this is what Mike can't stand. He's, he's not having it. He's not going to let Jody fucking get out of his sight. So he figures a way to get out of there. Unfortunately, on his way out of the house, the tall man attacks his ass and captures him, puts him in the hearse, and then while they're driving away, uh, he happens to have a gun on him, luckily. So, thank God for them guns, right? He shoots out the back window. He shoots out the tire. He jumps out the back window. So inside Morningside, Jody is checking out his parents' caskets, but he can't really bring himself to do it, even though that's what he went there for. Mike winds up looking into the caskets and realizes his parents have been taken. His, his parents' bodies have been taken by the tall man, and that's just, you know, heartbreaking for the poor guy. We get another scene with the sphere, and it's coming at Mike, and then Jody shows up with a shotgun and blows that motherfucker into smithereens. Turns out... Reggie's alive! We thought maybe he died. We didn't know what was going on. Reggie's alive. Not only that, but the, the aunt and the cousin and whatnot, they're fine. Now, here they are. They're in front of the main door. The door that leads to the, the portal. They open it up and then there's just all these barrels and these two poles just sticking out of the ground. And what do you know? They look a lot like tuning forks, don't they? So while they're in there screwing around, Mike falls into the other dimension and is able to see the tall man's home and where he's sending the Jawas, the slaves. Jody pulls him back into our dimension and then Mike tells him, you know, they, he crushes them because the gravity is so intense there. They apparently have to be smaller and it's very hot in their dimension. This also seems to be nothing but rocks. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a great place. Next thing you know, the lights go out, and then they get attacked by Jawas, and they're split up. Now, we've got what? Jody's outside looking for somebody. We've got Reggie's just in the room by himself. He realizes the similarities between these poles that are uh, basically operating as a portal and his tuning fork. So he decides to stop the vibration, the vibration being the thing that creates the portal to the other side by putting his hands onto these poles and it seems to reverse things or something maybe i don't fully understand what happens here everything gets sucked into the portal almost reggie himself he manages to get out now we are getting to the end here so things fall apart quite a bit for me uh, at the end unfortunately as much as i love this movie we have a scene now where Reggie goes outside and it's all windy and shit because the portal is, is like sucking in everything, I guess. And 
he sees the lady in lavender and he gets stabbed and, and apparently dies. Now, what my complaint is, is right here in this scene. First of all, this shouldn't have been Reggie in this scene to be stabbed by the lady in lavender. It should have been Jody because he has a prior history with her. He was making out with her in the cemetery earlier. So it would make more sense for Jody to come out, see the lady in lavender, recognize her and want to go and help and then getting stabbed. And then that would also make further sense considering that one of the twists of the movie, spoilers, is that Jody was already dead and that all of this was just an imagine, a part of Mike's imagination to try and keep him alive. But it would have made so much more sense to have Jody come out and be the one killed by the lady in lavender. So then when you have the, the actual reveal of the twist where Reggie's there and he says, none of that was real, the tall man didn't take Jody, it was just a dream, it would make so much more sense that Jody died in the dream, Reggie would still be alive there with Mike. So now Jody and Mike, having realized that Reggie's gone, everything else was fucked up, they're still trying to come up with a plan to defeat the tall man. Now, originally, this movie had like at least three different endings filmed. There was the ending where they used the fire extinguisher against the tall man because he doesn't like cold. Uh, there was the ending where they hang him, and that ultimately wound up in Phantasm 4. And then there's this ending where they drop him down a mine shaft. So, for some reason, this is the weirdest one. I don't know why they decided to... Oh, he'll fall down a mine shaft and be alright, despite all the other things that have happened. He got his finger back, he was in an explosion, he just keeps showing up. But hey, if, we, if, we, if he falls down a mine shaft, he can't come back from that, right? I don't know. It's some kind of weird logic. But they do. This is what they go for. They lead him there. He falls down. Jody drops some fucking boulders to seal him in. And then that's when Mike kind of comes to and he says, it's those, those rocks aren't going to hold him forever. And then Reggie says, the tall man's not real. Uh, he didn't take Jody from you. Jody died in a car accident. So again, it doesn't make sense that he would even say, it doesn't make sense that Reggie would tell him that... M the tall man didn't take Jody from him because in the fantasy, Jody wasn't taken from him. They defeated him. Now, had they had Jody be the one to die by the lady in lavender outside the mortuary, this would all make much more sense. How this little detail got messed up, I don't understand. I think that maybe they were in a little bit of a rush filming. This is a very low budget movie. There was no like studio support. Maybe just a detail or two got lost in the mix while trying to film an independent movie. That's, uh, that's the best I can say. So anyway, but then, so this is the end, and, and Reggie says, Look, I'm, let's go on a road trip. Go get your shit together. And when Mike goes upstairs, having apparently accepted the fact that none of it was real and that that was just a dream he had, sees the tall man in a mirror and then gets his ass pulled through the mirror. Because... Phantasm is a movie that insists on having its cake and eating it too. All right, let's uh, just talk about some final things before I give a, the rating and wrap her up. I just want to talk about how I really like this movie because of the pacing, because of the atmosphere. I like the themes. Everything about it just kind of plays to a part of yourself that's fascinated with, with death and what happens after death, what could be beyond it, and stuff like that. I want to say um, the performances are all pretty good. Angus Scrim as the tall man, naturally he nails it and he's beloved by all and for good reason. Even though he plays this scary man, somehow we still love him. I want to say Michael Baldwin, I think, is underrated in this movie. He does a great job. Uh, it just seems like in future, future movies with him, he's not... He doesn't, I don't know, he's not into it like he was in the first one. He's, he's a really good actor in this movie. He really sells it. I think he's underrated. He should have been in the second one. And the last thing I think I want to mention before we wrap it up is how you could totally play some great drinking games with Phantasm, this movie, but also just the whole franchise. Drink every time someone enters or exits the cemetery gates. Drink every time there's an explosion.
drink every time someone gets pulled through some glass or jumps through some glass, jumps through a window. Take two shots every time you see a sphere. And you know what, you guys, you're going to be pretty hammered in no time. <laughs> Enjoy that. I know I do. Now, I'm going to go ahead. Let's give it a rating. So, uh, I'm going to give it a solid, I want to give it a little more. I'm going to give it a four, four and a quarter. Yep, that sounds good to me. Because I think, I like Phantasm 1 more than most people. And it makes me a little sad. I think a lot of people are missing out. Four and a quarter, it's pretty good, man. Check it out.